OK, welcome, everyone. It's uh, 4 p.m. according to my clock, so we're going to begin this session. Um, my name is Chris Howard. I'm the director of the Professional Law Institute, uh, which is part of the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. I'd like to first of all, thank you for all. Uh, thank you all for coming along today uh, and taking the time out for what I hope will be an engaging discussion. Um, a few housekeeping points, first of all, before we begin. This uh, meeting is being recorded, so just to let you know that, and obviously that means that you'll be able to look at this uh, discussion after the fact. Um, as you'll see from the notification we sent out earlier today, uh, we've made a decision to host this as a Teams meeting. Um, that means that in theory, uh, everybody could uh, be part of the conversation, but obviously to keep things uh, orderly and to make sure we don't have any feedback issues or any other issues around sound, uh, I'd ask if you could all throughout this meeting keep your microphones switched off and keep your cameras switched off as well. So just to reiterate, if you could make sure that throughout the meeting you keep your microphone switched off and your camera switched off. If you find it is done for you, that'll be one of our team who will be uh, trying to make sure that all microphones and cameras are off. However, we do want you to contribute to this discussion. So if you have any questions or any uh, points you'd like to raise, please do put those in the meeting chat. For those of you who've used Microsoft Teams before, uh, if you sort of lurk your cursor over the toolbar in the middle of the screen, you'll find there's a chat function and you're very welcome to join the chat as we go through. We will try to answer or take on as many of your questions as we can during the meeting, um, but obviously we won't be able to get through to all comments. So uh, uh, please do bear with us as we do, do our best on that front. So let's begin uh, the discussion. Um, as I said, my name is Chris Howe, Director of Professional Law Institute at King's College London. This is the first online event that we've done. Uh, it's a continuation of sorts of our Future of Legal Practice series, which we've now held for the last two years. Um, just a quick plug, in a couple of weeks time on the 24th of June, we'll be doing another one of these talks on essential skills for future lawyers. So please do look out for further announcements on that front. I'm going to start by introducing our two speakers and then briefly introducing the topic, after which I'm going to hand over to our eminent speakers. So we're delighted to welcome back uh, Maury McLaren and Richard Macklin. Um, Maury and Richard uh, spoke first for the Professional Law Institute in February 2019, and their topic for that session was developments, disruptors and new entities in legal practice. Uh, at that time, we thought the biggest disruptor uh, affecting us was Brexit. Obviously, things have moved on significantly since then. Uh, and now uh, we have, unfortunately, to face a whole host of new disruptors and, and issues around the world, not least the coronavirus crisis, which obviously has changed the whole framework of the world and uh, has then set the scene for, for further uh, issues. So uh, today's focus is around COVID-19 and the impact of COVID on global legal practice. Again, just a reminder, if you could yeah, uh, switch off your mics uh, and cameras, that's great. So just to introduce our two speakers, uh, Maureen McLaren is somebody I met uh, many moons ago now through the International Bar Association. Maureen is a professional consultant working for Lexington Consultants. Uh, he's been advising some of the world's largest law firms for the past 20 years after training himself as a lawyer. He's also an associate professor of business at IE Business School. He's a fellow of Harvard's Institute of Coaching, and he was also the inaugural chair of the strategy group of the International Bar Association's Law Firm Management Committee. So it's a delight to have Moray back with us, and he'll be sharing uh, his insights. Alongside Moray, uh, so Moray is on the right on my screen with the glasses. Uh, uh, alongside him on the left is Richard Macklin. Uh, Richard Macklin is global vice chair of Dentons. For those of you, and I hope that's most of you who are uh, aware of the legal world. Denton's now has the title of being the largest law firm by headcount, at least uh, in the world, and is a major global player. I, I was looking at its range of offices, and I think it's fair to say that it's also the most geographically diverse firm, I would say, by uh, in those terms as well. Now, Richard's role at uh, Denton's, as well as being a, a partner in corporate and mergers and acquisitions, is as global vice chair. So I think he's uniquely placed to give a really uh, utterly expert view on the global legal situation for legal services by dint of that role. So we're very, very pleased to have uh, Richard with us today. And, and I'd like to thank him and Moray in advance 
for uh, agreeing to do this session for us. So the topic, as I said, is the impact of COVID-19 on global legal practice. And in a sense, this is a, an update and extension of the talk that Moray and Richard gave for us previously, which focused on the impact uh, or the rate of change and innovation in law firms in light of the new global environment. And this is obviously a hugely timely uh, opportunity to extend that discussion and continue it. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to uh, Moray and Richard, who are going to take us forward. And as I say, please, uh, throughout this conversation, if you'd like to put a question to Moray and Richard or make a comment, put it in the chat box uh, and I'll be keeping an eye on that. And so will uh, Richard and Moray too. But Richard, Moray, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you very much to the Professional Law Institute for inviting us to speak. Uh, I am in Madrid today. What a pity that I can't be uh, with you all, uh, and what a pity we can't be doing this face to face. When Richard and I were preparing this, we realized we were do doing so many webinars every day, we thought we'd try something a little bit different. We want to be informal, and we really want to make this more of a town hall, because we know that a lot of the people in the audience have, a, have some very, very uh, important questions here. So we would ask you to put questions into the chat box. And uh, what we thought we'd do is we thought that I would actually interview Richard. I've had the pleasure of working with Richard for the last 20 years, and uh, we tend to agree on most things. But instead of being boring this time, I'm going to take a role of devil's advocate, and I'm going to try and push back and try and ask Richard some of those most difficult questions. And, and let's see by whether, whether by the end of the hour we're still friends or not. <clears throat> so, I mean, our, our themes, very, very simply, is really... What has the impact of the crisis been in, in, in business? How would that impact on the law firms? And finally, I think we really need to bottom out. You've just frozen for a second, Maury, but we'll wait for you to update. I mean, Richard, do you want to pick up uh, where Maury's left off in terms of your theme? Sure, sure. So, <clears throat> yes, we'll work at, we're gonna look at where of what's happening in the client market, what's happening to law firms, and then who are going to be the winners and losers in the client market, uh, sorry, the law firm market, and what are the keys for success. And we also, for those of you, of you who are interested, very in, I'm perfectly happy to talk about what that might mean to people's careers, uh, future or existing uh, in the market, which is, you know, it's going to change um, post-COVID. So whilst Murray is Unknown participant is now joining. <laughs> Okay. Again, if you could just switch your microphone off, please, uh, whoever's just joined. Thank you very much. Okay. So, while Murray Unknown is participant is now exiting. Lovely but frozen. I'm going to answer the first question, which he was going to ask me, I know, which was, what's happening in the client market? Um, before we get to law firms, and then before we get to, well, how do we deal with that? Okay, so the first thing we wanted to look at is of course we're going to talk about covid this is what this is built about lots of bad stuff happening of course to all of us uh, both personally and financially and the career terms and lots of uncertainty um, and we don't want to belittle any of that in what we're saying we do think however there are some reason, reasons to be cheerful and some opportunity uh, which comes out of change and we'd like to talk a little bit about that too because some good stuff is going to come out of this too. Um, but change means opportunity, and it's always down to how adaptable are we uh, in the market, both our clients and the legal profession, and us within whichever side of that fence we sit, um, how well we adapt to that. And some of the things I would suggest, be very interested to hear other people's views, can be classified as temporary, in terms of the change that this situation is creating, and some of them more permanent. Um, and both actually spell some opportunity. And on the, the temporary side, I mean, just to take some really obvious examples, um, I've just asked your first question for you, Murray, okay? So I'm now answering it for myself, okay? <laughs> so. Welcome, thank you very much. You know, you know we, we always do better when I'm, when I'm not there. The good news is, if, if the technology fails at the beginning, we knew we should be okay for, for the next 15 minutes. We're bulletproof. Okay, so change, 
temporary and permanent. First thing, obvious things, temporary change. Temporary and Lots of industries in the client market struggling a lot, of course. Leisure, hospitality, stuff like that. Having a terrible time. But we will eat again. We will fly again. We will have holidays again. And therefore, the changes that are happening to the client market in those worlds are probably going to come back in some form or another. The question is in what shape, but they're going to come back. So let's put those in the temporary box, which is one part of the markets, the winners and losers um, landscape. Other things that pop up at times of crisis are arguably opportunities, also problems. Take fraud, for example. OK, times of crisis, just like when uh, if we look back at Lehman's, for example, that the, the last financial crisis, people do desperate things. People do stupid things. People do naughty things. People sometimes do things not intending to be bad, but when the tide goes out, realize it is bad. So, you know, look at Madoff, look at the LIBOR interest scandal, all those things pop up um, and it's empirically proved in much larger quantities following a crisis. Uh, and that's going to happen to our clients because there will also be, well, there are two things that are going to cause that, I think. One is the fact that whole layers of middle management are going to sadly be removed as a, as a result of this crisis because of the pressure on, on labor costs. And they are the gatekeepers for a lot of this behavior. Um, and secondly, there will be a lot of people out there, more whistleblowers out there as a result of that. And third, as I say, people do stupid things and desperate things and misstate their accounts and all sorts of things. So that's a big thing that is going to happen. But it's temporary. It's a blip that we see every crisis. Now, you could call that an opportunity for um, law firms or you could see that as a real systemic problem for the market. But then something else that's out there will happen as a result, but will hit and come down again. And then there are other things that I would say are opportunities for the legal profession, which are pockets of li liquidity they're going to pop up around the world if you take china for example china is coming out of this crisis faster of course than other parts of the world there's a whole cycle that we're going through but those cycles don't run together they run counter cyclically in different geographical markets which means when you've got a pocket of liquidity popping up in china or let's say sovereign wealth uh, in the middle east you might have distressed assets in the west in europe in the us which creates heat, which creates transactional activity, which again, you can see as an opportunity in the market. But again, those things are part of the temporary box of change that's going to occur as a, re as a result of uh, COVID in, in the client market. Now let's look more at what permanent changes might occur, uh, which is perhaps more about what we want to talk about today. Now, again, looking at just two, two examples uh, in in the client market or the business market. Uh, let's take air travel. Air travel is never going to be the same again. Right? We suddenly worked out, actually, did we really need to fly to New York for all those meetings? Did all those transactions really need to happen face to face? Yes, of course, we do much, much more virtually than we used to. But nevertheless, an awful lot uh, we've discovered, look at us now, doesn't need to be done face to face. It was obvious, but we weren't really doing it. And uh, certainly talking to a number of airlines that we're at for, they're realizing that it, the toothpaste is out of the tube. It's not going to go back to anything like it was before. I think everybody Fair. understands that. And indeed, you know, for example, is one airline. Joining. We, hello, welcome. Uh, one of the um, airlines that uh, we're talking to right now, uh, we're talking about telepresence. We're talking about, well, do you really need to fly people everywhere? Why don't you, you know, there's great holographic um, technology now where people can be almost, you know, like Star Trek, beamed into a room almost, you know, uh, in 3D uh, form. Why not brand that with the airline and start making a profit, which airlines never do? So, you know, the ones that succeed will take advantage of the fact that toothpaste out of the tube. And I think that's a theme that law firms as well as, as the client market would do well to, to think about. Um, just one other example of things that will never go back to normal, commercial real estate. Look at us all now. Are we sitting in offices? I imagine some of you are, but I imagine most of you aren't, right? I'm certainly not. Um, and maybe we didn't need them, <laughs> or as many of them. I think we've all worked that out. So we don't need nearly as much real estate. The other thing 
is look at what's happening to retail. I mean, the high street, sadly for those corporations, and the employees within them was already dying. But this is going to accelerate and already is massively the change um, in commercial real estate, not just in offices, but also in retail and everything else. I mean, imagine Oxford Street as a row of Amazon warehouses. It's not inconceivable that Selfridges becomes an Amazon warehouse, right? <laughs> you know, you could call that a uh, from shops to sheds. You know, this could happen. And commercial real estate, which is a fairly um, slow to change market, is probably going to go through some very, very serious disruption. It's probably going to need some help in working out how it retools itself, how it becomes more temporary, how it becomes more flexible, adaptable, nimble, nimble, using technology and other things to make use of the bricks and mortar that they control. And that's a permanent change that's going to happen. So just a few thoughts on there are some temporary things, there are some permanent mm. things. Um, and ultimately, it's all about the drive from cost to value, yeah, which we'll, we'll come back to. So um, uh, I'm trying to work out whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Uh, I mean, since, since we spoke last, Richard, I've done a number of uh, uh, similar calls with law firms around the world. Um, let's switch over to think about law firms now. And what I'm seeing is I'm seeing some good news and some bad news. I would almost be tempted to say the, the short-term impact on law firms is, is less than we thought. Lawyers can work at home. Law firms can overcome the, the cash challenges they have. But actually, it's the, the longer term that would be, really be, uh, will have more impact. And, and I'd like to, as, as Chris was saying, our last presentation was about change in law firms. And I'd like to get a feel from you as we work through this of whether you think the extent to which this will it simply accelerate the change that we're seeing or whether it will, it will bring something new. So let me ask a question. Um, bearing in mind the change we're seeing in the client world, what do you think that will, how will that impact for a law firm like yours? Uh, well, as you know, I'm a massive optimist, always have been, and uh, I, 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 I like change and I think um, we do well to embrace it. And I'm excited uh, about the acceleration, you're right, I think you use the word acceleration. I mean, there are lots of things we talked about last time and, you know, it's, 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 it's a subject that lots of people have opinions on. Um, but, you know, the, the, law, the law profession has been in disruption for a good 10 years, if not more, and it doesn't look anything like it did 10 years ago. And in, you know, by the time the next crisis comes, which it will within less than 10 years, because they always do, uh, it, uh, we'll be looking back, we're still here saying, well, it's, it's changed completely. So that change, I think, is actually very exciting. Obviously, those who embrace it are going to be the winners. Um, if you look at the last crisis, 2008-9, the Lehman's crisis, for example, I mean, I think what that happened, what happened there was, of course, it became a buyer's market. Yeah. So law firms who've been enjoying a party for some time uh, and doing very nicely, thank you. Uh, finally, the clients came, turned around quite rightly and said, you know what? We don't really need to pay the way we've been paying before, not necessarily in terms of rates, but, you know, we need more value, et cetera, et cetera. So there was this sort of more for less agenda that came out of the last crisis, not least because in-house legal teams had to deliver more for less as they were being slashed and their budgets were being slashed. And uh, they had to themselves justify their existence by giving more to the internal client. Um, and then they turned around to us and said, we've got to do the same. And I think there was a desire, and I certainly there's some very prominent speakers who I respect greatly among some of the FTSE 100 who got together very, you know, to really push the death of the hourly rate, which I actually have some sympathy with as a model. And I would say they didn't quite succeed. They moved us along the, the chain a little bit. But basically, what did we do as a profession? In all honesty, we just found ways to squeeze a bit more. Um, value for the client and margin for us out of the same old hours we were selling. You know, we did a bit of disaggregation. We used a bit of low tech. You know, we we did change the way we did things a little bit, but not as much as uh, maybe the market wanted or required us to do. Um, I think I'm just going to jump in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Richard, yeah. Is this a good moment? I don't want to. Yes, feel free to jump, jump in. Yeah. That's great. Uh, uh, first of all, just a quick uh, point of order. Um, if anybody's not aware, the previous talk, which uh, Richard and Moray have alluded to, is available on our Professional Law Institute website for you to listen to. So if you want to go back to that talk, please do have a listen to that. Really, really good stuff. Uh, we've got two questions uh, that have come in that uh, one of them, I think, actually relates to what you're saying at the moment, 
Richard, and one of them, uh, it doesn't relate, but but I'm sure you would be interested in coming to. I might take the second question first. This is from Vivek Prashar. Um, I'm going to just read it out because it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, a, a detailed question. Um, the global economy is currently in the main on life support uh, from government or central bank support. Um, the sectors and markets will reshape and will lose many faster to failure pushed by COVID-19, etc. And the next, and I think this is the heart of his question, um, the beyond is difficult to see as this is not a financially driven crisis. Non-revenue generators will be a drag. So what, is, what are the big bet influences in your view? What I, I, I might take that as meaning what's the next problem, but you can take that in your in your own understanding. So what are the big bet influences in your view? Well, let's just go back to whether this financial crisis or not um, first, if I may. And um, I think, I mean, my fear is this is going to be a double dip, as in at the moment, you know, we've uh, we you know, we have indeed, as Vivek says, suffered a slowdown because of something that isn't economically uh, driven, uh, but has put everything on hold. I think, however, following this, as we realize the cost of what's about to hit us because of that, we are going to suffer a massive, um, a massive uh, economic shock. Uh, and this links actually to the point that I was saying just previous, and I will get to the to Vivek's second point. But I think what will happen as a result of COVID, which didn't happen as a result of, of Lehman's, is that because of the massive shock that is about to hit us, in my view, to pay for what has just been going on, we are about to have uh, uh, a very big change in the market in terms of more. It's not going to be more for less. This is going to be really genuinely nudging us to new business models. As in, I, I can see that the death of the hourly rate now could happen. I can see that we may have to move. Thank you. I'd be delighted because I think about time we did to managed services, to data driven pricing, to data driven positions taking in, in negotiation instead of wasting time on positions that are hopeless, you know, backwards and forwards. So I think those things will happen as a result of this, because not least. The economic shock is enormous, but also the technology is here now that wasn't there 10 years ago. There's so much technology now that will facilitate the ability, for example, particularly to drive our business model off to data, data driven um, uh, models, that I think there will be a, a real shift from the old, you know, the 300 year old model of, of, of charging hours. Now, back to Vivek's question. Remind me again, what are the big drivers of? Sorry. Uh, I'll just rewind to the to the question in its fullness. OK, mm -hmm. so. Uh, the beyond, in quotes, is difficult to see as this is not a financial driven crisis. Non-revenue generators will be a drag. So what are the big bet influences in your view? The, the, the sectors we see that are going to be the, the ones to bet on, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I'm probably stating the obvious, but, um, you know, logistics, technology, uh, pharmaceutical, um, I suppose, uh, are fairly obvious. I think, um, uh, as we said earlier, anything that needs bricks and mortar uh, will definitely be in, in trouble. Um, and I do think, as we'll come to later, that having a digital mindset uh, is going to be hugely important going forward. And the industries that feed off that are going to do very well. I, I don't know if that answers the question, Vivek. I hope it does. If can, not, I, um, can I jump in? I can see my first chance to be controversial here. Um, uh, I, one of, the, one of the managing partners I've been working with it always says, we talk about the global economy, but then we never realize that, that actually uh, law as a profession and lawyers like, as a profession are, are, like, are like cockroaches. Uh, it'll only be the cockroaches and the lawyers that survive any of this global change we see. So what I can see on the revenue of the law firms I'm working with, there was a short term hit on corporate transactions because a lot of the corporate transactions actually stopped. <laughs> then, depending on which country it is, and depending how bad the economic situation was, the prices dropped so quickly that corporate took off very, very well. But of course, let's remember that even right. if corporate is quiet, you've got your disputes. It's in many now exiting. In many countries, the courts were closed, but they're now open again. And then we've got, got all of the people that are working on the, the refinancing work. Now, a number of law firms are looking to next year, and they're saying, um, we will have an un unholy alliance whereby the, the M&A market will pick up again because the assets will be low. We'll, have, we'll be going full guns on our disputes 
and our business restructuring and next year that we will be having a boom at some stage and we know that it's coming and if you think that there's a boom coming next year of course that is bound to have an impact on what you're going to do to your law firm today and if you want to we can talk a bit about some of the mistakes that law firms have made in the last downturn which is their learning uh, which is going forward as an example many law firms did reduce the number of junior lawyers and when the market the market took off again growing people is like growing a tree and if you cut off a branch of a tree you can't put it back again and if you take out certain types of lawyers you will have gaps unknown you, participant is now going. joining so just just being a little bit controversial there richard to, to some extent do you think law firms are a bit bulletproof around this or not no um and the reason i say that is because in my glorious 35 year career at um my law firm, I've been almost bankrupted personally twice. Uh, and uh, law firms are, despite what many think, and I'm, I'm sure there are many colleagues in the profession listening today, and I'd love to know what they think. But in my view, it's a bit like being on the Titanic in that, you know, it's great. It's great when it so it, it, it sails. But, you know, if you puncture the seventh uh, vessel, bang, over it goes. Because um, if you take us, we're two and a half billion dollars uh, in terms of revenue. It sounds like a lot of money to some. I know to some it won't. The, the bottom line is that is a tiny business on the global stage. You know, we are a cork bobbing on the ocean. Yeah. On top of that, um, we have a strange model law firm. So we don't really hold much. Um, uh, uh, we don't retain our earnings. We distribute them all. So basically, we're very, very vulnerable because if if our only asset, which is the people all run for the door, everyone else left holds the debt. The seventh chamber is pierced and down we go. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just saying that's what happens. It's a precarious business. Um, and it doesn't take much um, to to damage very seriously um, a, a law firm that is a partnership, because after all, you know, a great number of the people are business owners themselves and hold the equity. So it is dangerous um, in terms of what the activity is. Yes. You know, one says, well, law, lawyers do well because on the way down and on the way up in the market, as long as there's movement in the market, there's work. Yes. That is true. That is yeah. true. So, you know, our restructuring business will do well and our M&A business will do less well. But uh, the bottom line is uh, that activity, we're certainly predicting, I know many of my friends in other similar firms who I speak with a lot, we're all predicting a very large reduction in activity. We started with Brexit, don't forget. I know it feels like, you know, three centuries ago that, but it did actually already put, it pierced a couple of chambers already, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. this is going to pierce a few more. Um, I, actually, are, can, I, can I just uh, yeah. jump in there, Richard, if I may, um, in, in a strange link, I'm going to pick up on the word chambers there. We had a question early on uh, from Amelia about barristers. Now, I know that, that obviously you're a solicitor, I'm a solicitor, and, and, and that's our uh, sector of practice. But... Obviously, there's an interconnection between the world of barristers and the world of, uh, of solicitors. So Amelia's question was around whether the fragile economic situation or how that will affect aspiring barristers uh, and universities and the bar generally. I suppose it's the same point that Moray was making a moment ago about uh, the extent to which chambers need to curate and, and maintain that human flow, if you like, so as yeah. not to be caught out by either the ups or the downs of the situation. And, and any views on barristers? I know that, as I say, it's not your specialist area. Or Moray, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, Yeah. well, just a very quick question. The, 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 different, the difference for the barristers, of course, and we'll talk about the criminal bar, is that the government sets the rules and the government sets the tariffs. So they are particularly vulnerable when it comes to legal aid being changed. Um, what we've seen in law over the last 40 years is law, law, the, the, the law firms going from a profession where lawyers were autonomous and independent into becoming a business and what it means to be a business. And if you join a modern law firm, you, 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 you give up your, your independence you know, when you check in at the security desk. And depending on how you're managed, you more or less have targets and you more or less have some guidance on what you should do. The barristers, a large majority of the barristers haven't been through that modernization process they are very independent and autonomous. That means they don't have any economies of scale. They have to professionalize. They need to build their, um, their technology, their learning and development, their management um, capacity. And because of the autonomy of the barristers, they're not willing to contribute what's required to become a more professional business. So barristers as a whole have a particular challenge. They are 40 or 50 years behind the law firms we see. And if the government sets the regulations and the government sets the regulations and change them, 
you are in a very, very difficult situation. And I can't see an easy way forward for the criminal bar at the moment. Richard, what are we going to say? Two reasons to be cheerful, in my view. Oh, yes, right? please. So, <laughs> so I think this could be good time for good times for barristers. Uh, on the criminal side, the beauty of uh, crime is uh, it is completely uh, resilient to financial markets, right? It just carries on. On top of that, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, in the world of fraud and investigations, the best stuff, if we're being, forgive me, mercenary about this, comes now, okay? Or will be popping out as the tide goes out in about six months, 12 months time, the li LIBORs and Madoffs and all the rest of it are about to be exposed. So that's very exciting, I think, for that part of the bar. And the rest of uh, 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 the criminal world um, is largely unaffected and probably encouraged to work a little harder during these hard times. So that's good. <laughs> on, on the civil side, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Murray, uh, as transactional work decreases because there isn't the money or the confidence to create new transactions, what we see every single time uh, in uh, times of crisis or post-crisis is increase in litigation, uh, largely because, uh, apart from the obvious, you know, in, uh, restructuring uh, the uh, work that goes on, insolvency uh, litigation that goes on, of course, but in addition, I notice this very markedly after Lehman's, everybody tries to squeeze more money out of the deal they did before the crisis and wished they hadn't done. <laughs> so, so they start suing on the warranties and they start arguing about what's in the and getting it out of the drawer and much more work appears for litigators so which means great work for the bar so i'm i'm relatively optimistic actually for, for and obviously that means for students going into the bar you know that that through flow will continue to persist if 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 there's a good amount of work albeit in a different se sector yeah i think so and and there's one other thing i'm say about you know the the through flow we i don't think we're atypical as a firm and i know we're not in the bar but i think it it, it translates to what you're saying chris i mean we are maintaining all of our trainee contract obligations uh, for this uh, next in intake. We are not making anyone at all uh, redundant through what we see as a probably 20, 30 percent revenue downturn that's about to hit us. Uh, we have furloughed people. We have asked for voluntary um, four day weeks or 80 percent time and all that, those kind of things, which lots of our peers have done, too. We're really, really keen to be sort of in this together, uh, by which I do mean, by the way, the, the partners aren't taking out any profits for at least a year as well, by the way, um, which is more than 20 percent. Uh, but it's important that we ride through this storm together because we feel very strongly, as I think, you know, Murray was alluding to and you, Chris, is that this is going to be over. And when it is over, it's, I think it's going to be worse than people might think for a while because the double dip. But when it comes back, It'll probably come back fast and we'll all be scrambling for talent, which is what happened after Lehman's. So how about this time we just curate, as you said, that talent um, so that we're ready for the, and, the upturn. And I would just add one thing. Listen to what Richard is saying. I think lawyers need to have clearer focus about the type of lawyer they want to be because they're going to have to become more specialised more quickly. And when Richard talks about the type of cases that are come, going to come forward, you have to decide what is it that I I'm passionate about what do I have a particular interest in and actually specialise on an earlier stage. Vivek's question about where to make a bet. I'm, I'm working with an Indian law firm at the moment. Technology, booming. Health, booming. Government, yes, that will be a major client as long as they can pay the bills. Uh, Defence and, and, and health. So, I mean, you can almost understand which areas of laws will be required and you can almost try and match that with your own interest as a, as a young lawyer. But before we go to the, the career and the changes in the career path, Richard, let's go back to the law firms and change and tell us a little bit more about what are you, what changes do you think we're going to see in the, the way law firms work? Um, well, like I said, I think our business models will have to change because yeah. um, of uh, a very, very strong move now to um, disaggregating, using tech, uh, managed services, all those things I've said earlier, data driven stuff. Um, the question I think more is, you know, who's going to be a, among the winners yes, of that? You know, what, is, you know, what does it take to survive that? Uh, and, well, and it's, it's, that presumably you've got to be resilient at times like this. Right. 
And a lot of people talk about organizational resilience, which is true. Um, but I think really, you know, organizational resilience, apart from, yes, of course, we have to have um, very, very, very robust cybersecurity and all those other things that we now have as businesses across the world, et cetera. Of course, we all do. We're all very sophisticated these days um, as law firms. But I think actually we need to concentrate on personal resilience as well and individual resilience. And talking earlier, uh, uh, you were saying, you know, well, what are the skill sets that might be important going forward? And I know it's sort of, you know, no one was talking about resilience 10 years ago. It's sort of become this buzzword. But all it means is an ability to roll with the punches, right? Um, yeah. And it's for a business to do that. It's very, very important that as individuals have that mindset and ability as well, in my view. Um, and I think what's, what's, you know, interesting is in times of crisis, you know, you see... I don't know if other people listening to this have felt the same, but you sort of see people's characters, strengths and weaknesses um, magnified. Let's put it that way, as the sense of danger increases. So just as you know, you see and we've seen and I'm sure lots of people listening have seen wonderful acts actually of courage and altruism and community going on both in their personal lives and their professional lives. Uh, in this situation, which indeed we did see in, in Lehman's as well, and you always do in a crisis, you know, you also see a lot of ang anxiety and you that can translate into aggression, which, as we know, let's face it, is just an expression of fear. Yeah. Um, so that ability to roll with the punches yeah, is very valuable because some of that stuff is 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 pretty toxic in an organization. As I say, it gets hugely magnified at times of stress. And I think, you know, that um, some of us older people, there's a lot we can't bring, like we're not that good at tech as Chris Murray and I know, having tried for about 24 hours to hook up to this thing today. <laughs> but one thing we do have, because we're old, is a bit of experience. And, you know, this is the third global crisis that I've been privileged to enjoy. And I can say the first time uh, I was in blind panic, that was the first time we nearly went bankrupt. The second time again, we nearly went bankrupt. I was concerned, but assured because I knew the drill. And this time, to be frank, it's no, it's no better. It's probably going to be worse, uh, both for me personally and pro professionally. But I'm philosophical about it because we've been there before. And that experience is just, it's nothing to do with my genetics. It's the fact that I've just seen it before. And I think, you know, as leaders, you know, if we can pass some of that on to help people understand that from crisis, you know, your bad stuff, you know, yeah. there are two, things, two certainties. One is bad stuff always passes. Second thing is you learn from it and come out stronger. Richard, yeah. I'm going to break in there um, yeah. on that very positive note. Uh, I've got a, a comment and a couple of quick fire questions for you. Um, so do, do uh, everybody else in the conversation have a look at Vivek's uh, further comment where he's uh, really re affirmed what, what, what you had said in your previous talk and in this talk about the acceleration of change in things like commoditized work and the le legal technology. So a really interesting comment there around around tech and and changing forms of practice. Um, two quick fire questions. Uh, one question from uh, Sabrina, which was around um, how clients and lawyers are going to liaise in the future. Uh, and you mentioned earlier meetings kind of drying up and international travel. So what do you think is going to be the long term impact on the way that uh, communications are carried out between lawyer and client? And then second quick fire question is uh, from Nia. She said, as a corporate partner, when do you believe the market will rebound in this area? Would you say funds is a busier area at this time? Obviously, we are being recorded and uh, you don't have to give a financial prediction if you don't want to. But uh, uh, so two, two quick ones there for you, Richard. OK, well, the first one, sorry, the first one was uh, me. in terms of communication. How do you think? Clients oh, yeah, communication. OK, well, I think it's more about I mean, sure, we'll be doing more of this. Uh, the only thing that actually a client said to me the other day, she said, said, why do I now have to see you before? We just used to ring ourselves each other all the time. That's all we ever used to do. <laughs> why do I now have to, you know, make sure the kitchen tables, you know, tidy and do my hair. So, <laughs> but I think we'll become more visual, but I don't think we'll become more physically present, yes. But I think what will change much more is the dynamic between clients and 
providers, particularly in-house lawyers and out-house lawyers. And I think for way too long, um, sitting on the inside of a law firm, you know, you see these clients, where I hear my colleagues talk about these clients, that they're sort of these mythical beasts that you see wandering through the forest from time to time that you catch a glimpse of and wonder where they live and how they work. They're just human <laughs> beings, it turns out, like the rest of us, right? And in fact, we're clients because we get sold to all the time, don't we? We're buying a car, we're buying double glazing, whatever. So I think we will move towards much more partnering with clients, by which I mean we, the external lawyers with the internal lawyers will start finally to work as a team to serve their internal client which is the business because for a long time to be frank the them and us has been law firm client and this amorphous mass of business people strategy people and lawyers i think it's going to be much more about the lawyers on the one side in-house and outhouse and the business that we are all together serving and i think that really is going to change it's already starting to but i think with this uh, this acceleration yeah of business delivery it'll change so uh, second question forgot uh, it already question was, our, was our funds question um yeah would you, as a corporate partner when do you think the market will rebound in in the corporate sector and would you say funds is a busier area right now well i think there are certain types of funds obviously i mean you've got specialized um uh distress funds of course they're going to be um i mean the incorrect term is vulture funds, you know, but people who specialised in distressed assets, they, of course, are going to be busy. I think also uh, on the fund side that because of what we were talking about earlier, about the economic shock that is about to hit us in no uncertain manner and the distressed assets going to be lurking around. It's a really quite tasty one, sadly. I think even funds who are not operating in the distressed market um, are going to dip their toe quite seriously into that market in a way that even they didn't after Lehman's, because there are going to be some um, very uh, tempting assets uh, in real distress in a way that I don't think we've seen before. So I think that will bring um, larger parts of the funds market in that uh, that uh, you know wasn't necessarily there before. So it won't be a specialist market that I don't think anymore. Thank you. Well, Mark, they, you carry on. Yeah, no, I, I mean, they, I get the resilient thing and, and, and presumably business has to be more nimble and more flexible. So they have to be able to change more quickly as certain sectors and circuit, certain clients are required. Yeah, I mean, quite right. It's not the uh, most. Plus four, uh, four, seven, nine, nine, zero, eight, six, 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 eight. Is now exiting. See you guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Um, uh, yes, flexibility, adaptability. Well, it's, as we know, not the strongest. It's the most adaptable that survive, uh, generally speaking. Uh, my, and, you know, that's clearly going to be uh, the most important thing, as it always is. Uh, but I should have a lovely example of a, a business I was mentoring recently. So I must tell you about adaptability. An absolute, uh, a heartwarming story, actually. I'll come to that in a second if you remind me. But yeah. my real concern is that despite the fact that we've been talking endlessly to death about the new normal, the new abnormal, everything's you know, everyone's sick of hearing it. You know, I honestly worry that it's not going to change as much as we could make it change. That's my fear. It's not my prediction, but it's my fear. Yeah, because humans, you know, amongst, you may or may not count lawyers, but definitely humans, you know, we resist change. And we always do the minimum necessary to keep our heads above water, as opposed to embracing radical change uh, because it's, it imports some risk, albeit with, with possibly high returns. Unknown so I participant think, is now joining. So I think there's a huge opportunity for those who want to get ahead of the story now. Really huge, bigger actually than there's ever, ever been. Uh, and I fear that the if we lose that appetite, if we don't embrace that opportunity to change now, it will diminish super quickly. You know, it's remarkable. I just actually have gone across town for the first time in two months. I had to for something. Uh, I was in the back of a cab for the first time in two months. The streets were a bit emptier and all the rest of it, but actually it, it was depressingly normal. You know, <laughs> I just worry that <laughs> the moment we start going back, we'll just forget it all. So I would beseech people to take, 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 um, Take the opportunity to change. Take the opportunity. But, yeah. 
to, to tell us your heartwarming charity story. Oh, yes. Right. So very quickly, I do some mentoring for a Virgin startup. Business. Well, it's v Virgin administer government startup loans, amongst other things. And and one of the uh, things that they require anyone who takes one of the loans and the startup businesses is that they must take a mentor um, to make sure they spend the money wisely. And I'm privileged to be one of those mentors. And I've done many over the years. But the one that um, I'm particularly fond of is a restaurant that sells gluten-free, lactose-free, refined sugar-free. Sounds revolting, but it's the most delicious <laughs> food. I'll give it a plug. It's called Apro Food on St. John's Street. It's wonderful. Um, anyway, but I was really worried. We've been so busy restructuring our business at our law firm, really busy, that I hadn't had a chance to talk to them for two months. And then they called me or asked for a call. And I was really, really worried because I thought they do 40 covers. They do the most amazing product. They've won Time Out Restaurant of the Year in their sector. They've done a double paid spread in Vogue. I mean, they're fantastic. But they're a restaurant in COVID, right? And they're new. So I was dreading the call. I got the call. Danny, the guy who called me, I said, Danny, I don't know what to say. And, and, and he said, yeah, no, it's a real problem. You know, me and X, the other person he works with, just really not getting on again. And, you know, and I said, right, right. So we sort of said, well, do you want a session on that? So yeah, we had a session on that. And I'm thinking, so basically I'm doing marriage guidance counseling. But I said, when's he going to tell me they've gone bankrupt? And I said, <laughs> but OK, we'll deal with that. But how's the business? He said, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. He said, in a week, we flipped it into a premium frozen food, um, health food business. We've now tripled our turnover. We're sending stuff <laughs> all over the country. Uh, we've got a central kitchen. We got rid of the restaurant. They did that in six days. Brilliant. Adaptability. Warming that's exactly. that, that, That's a great example of, of a phenomenon. I hope we're going to see plenty of over this period. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I might uh, put to Maury, actually. Um, so uh, first of all, a follow up question from Amelia. Um, which is how do you think this is going to how do you think the current crisis is going to impact on students aiming to read law at university in 2021 so i guess thinking of the next generation again um and then a second question going back to something i think you said earlier Mori, about government work uh Seema's asked uh could you elaborate on the government work that will see an increase so one question about a sector and another one going back to the issue of law students yes yeah, so sh should we talk about law students i think because um yeah. One thing that Richard and I agree on very much is um, at the moment, law is changing. And at the moment, the aims and expectations of a new generation of people are changing too. And, and there really is a, 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 a good opportunity for, for, for both the law firms and for the individuals. I've been working in an organization, well, supporting an organization called Law Without Walls for the last 10 years. And I have seen how we've gone from people studying law, calling themselves a lawyer, going to work from a, into, into a law firm, so people that study law, they pick up other skills, they go into some alternative legal provider, or they go into the alternative legal part of a law firm. And, and, and if, you're, if your group are interested, we can talk about some of these people and we can talk about some of the skills they've got. There, is a, there are huge new opportunities for, for people within law. So it goes back to your point, Richard, no? how to embrace change. Say four or five years ago, if you and I were speaking on this topic, we wouldn't be sure yet what those new careers are within alternative law. And, and now we are. Now we know the people. Now we know the skills. And now we know the roles. Now, my confession to you guys is when I came out of law school, I had my training contract cancelled. I had a very, very different an alternative legal career with a very, very different set of skills. I've, I've worked with lawyers for the 25 years. So I just think that there are the opportunities there. And it's a case of maybe it's your point, Richard, thinking differently uh, and embracing change. I mean, if, if people are interested in talking about those alternatives, if you put that into chat, maybe Richard and I can talk specifically about some of the people we know doing some of those alternative roles and also what are the skills required to do those because it, it's going to be about law but it's going to be about other aspects as well so yes so we have for example just to uh, just to quickly you know we now employ legal innovators we employ legal te technologists we employ legal project managers you know none of these jobs existed even three three years ago right and now there's a huge market and everyone's scrambling for them so i would you know suggest 
anyone look out there for those alternative careers because if you've got the combination of legal understanding and technical understanding or project management understanding um, then or innovation uh, then uh, you are going to be highly in demand and I think actually that 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 goes some way to answering a question that Laura's put to us, which is uh, she's mentoring a student finishing law school this year uh, and is worried about, and her student is worried about securing a training contract. And I think I, that's part of the answer I would give as well, that actually, although training contracts may be in shorter supply during uh, during the crisis or maybe not, I'm really pleased to hear about Denton's approach. Um, but, uh, you know, even if a straightforward training contract isn't there, look at those other options, start uh, really investigating the alternative roles. Um, I mean, Helen Lovegrove Love Love has said that tech roles seem reasonably, relatively easy to find, but not necessarily the others. Yeah, the project manager type roles, I think they're, are they more difficult, do you think, to, to get into? Well, we've got different job titles. I mean, one that I've got on my list, Richard, is Marisha, who, you know, Thacker, who, who's with the Denton's office in Washington. Her job title is Legal Solutions Architect. Okay, Legal Solutions Architect. Marisha did the LLM in Cornell tech in New York, Richard and I are going to be working with them later this year. And she has now has a role in working on the, the, the technology required to deliver the client's services in the right way. If you look at many of the alternative legal providers like Wavelength Law, what Wavelength do is they're, they're legal engineers and they want people that like project management, like technology. Uh, a lot of mathematicians go and work for wave, Wavelength. And they're looking at how to take the more standardized legal processes and how to do those in the best way for their clients. And one, to, to mention another name, one of the people I've worked closely with is, is Erica Bogano. She's a graduate from Miami Law School. Her role, I've written down her role, is she's head, head of legal innovation and design. And she has a client interfacing role again on how to make sure the clients get the services required. Uh, I mean, maybe we cycle back to that at the end, Richard, because I know that you and I are both a bit cynical about the title of innovation within law, and we well, have, just... we have we have overused the word innovation. But there is there are a lot of roles with this word innovation, technology, and project management. Yes, Richard. Can I just be devil? Oh, I'm going to be you for a second, Morrow, and be devil's advocate yes. here. Did, I mean, th these roles exist and they're great, and I think those who are enjoying performing those roles are, are forging some great career paths. But do you think actually most of those roles require you to have trained as a lawyer first before you can then go on to be an innovations manager? Because if you're a, a young student thinking, how can I become a project manager or an innovation manager? Yeah. Uh, have you still got to, to, to earn your stripes as a trainee and then have the same problem of getting a training contract? So the answer actually is no, but um, it would be hugely beneficial hugely beneficial so you may you ask chris about legal project managers i can tell you the people who are the most prized and valuable on our recruitment roster right now are legal project managers by which i don't mean people running around with clipboards asking me have you done that project yet or that that piece of, that's not what they do they are they do things which I didn't know existed, which actually the corporate world's been doing forever, right? We lawyers are just the cogs in the machine that make the product. They're the people who run the machine to make it run more smoothly for the client. And they are phenomenally clever, phenomenally bright. They come from really sensible companies where they've learned this skill before us. So the legal project managers are the people who are most in demand at the moment. Uh, right, do they need to have studied law? No. Do they are legal innovators? No. Does it make an enormous difference on hiring? Yes. Um, we've got a guy who does our contract automation, for example. He has the extraordinary skill of having a, uh, been an MA lawyer with us for 12 years, uh, but happens to be just techie in, in his mind and always has been, and has now branched out uh, to form his own consultancy. He's going to make more money out of us uh, doing that with those two skills together, uh, automating our contract, because he understands both the content and how to automate them. Uh, than he would ever have done uh, as a continuing MA lawyer with us. So it helps. And then, yeah, then I would agree with that. What if people can't can't get um, contracts, Richard? What? Do... Oh, it's tantalising, Murray. What? What? Yeah. what? <laughs> like, well, I guess like, maybe the question was going to be, what, what advice would you give to somebody who is at that starting point, can't get a training contract, and wants to get that way in? So um, I would honestly suggest looking at these other types of uh, role and if 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 it's possible to spend time 
learning those other skills um, such that you come with something else. Um, I mean, I can't, you know, really mean, you know, legal project managers of the type that we're, we're hiring now, in particular, people with legal technical skills, people or just technical skills that can do process management. Um, you know, we're shifting from hourly rate to managed services. We're doing data, data analytics, massive, right? Every, there's so much data that we haven't been mining that's made us so inefficient. I do think we're going to be doing data driven pricing, right? I don't think we're going to be charging forever. You know, how many hours did it cost? Therefore, we're going to charge you that. I think it's going to how, we're going to do the other way around. How many times have we done this in the past? How much did it cost? OK, well, this time we'll just charge you a fixed rate of this. We'll win some, some we'll lose some. But because our data is so sophisticated, we know we'll make a margin at the end of the year um, on the aggregate. You know, those kind of skills are going to be in very high demand. I mean, it's interesting because uh, two comments that have come in, one from Helen Lovegrove again, about the, the recognition of the status and the importance of those people as being as important as the straight black letter lawyer, if you like. Um, question come in from, I'm not sure who, uh, who the person is, but do you think law firms will need to change their structures to allow senior roles for legal project managers? I, I think that's happening already from what I've heard, that the, the individuals are, are attaining that status. Absolutely. No, our head of legal um, project management uh, is, I would put on a par with, you know, junior equity status, junior partner status. Yeah. Great. Maury, you're back with us. Uh, now we're nearly at the uh, end of time. We've got about five minutes to go. Maury, were there any issues you wanted to to get into before we have, uh, before we conclude? No, I, I mean, my question is really, have, have we answered the, the, the question? And the one So well, tantalising. Sorry again, again the one it sounded like the one uh, question. The one. Uh, I mean, I, just very briefly coming back to the um, question about government work that, that we didn't, I think, have time to get to. Any views on that, Richard, and the extent to which uh, government uh, as a as a sector? Yeah. So uh, yes, massive government work. Something actually funny enough, we do an awful lot of. And uh, but we've got an interesting thought about government work. Um, on the one hand, yes. Um, there's a sort of temporary element of the fact there's a lot of new regulation coming out because of what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And there'll be some more regulation coming out as a result of it, et cetera. But the rates are low. They do pay, but they pay not well. And a lot of law firms aren't that interested uh, in doing quite a lot of what's out there. However, something that is interesting that we're looking at very closely is selling government skills or government craft, if you like, to the private sector. and what we've realized is, you know, our clients are scrambling and desperate to know how to deal with government departments because things are changing so quickly and will continue to do so. And of course, we've got a new government and everything. You know, a lot is changing fast, not just because of COVID. And we've realized, having now been on the government panel uh, complex and other for about six, seven years now, I think, um, we've learned an awful lot, as have many, many, many law firms about what I would call government craft. And so, on the one hand, yes, loads of government work out there, uh, tons and tons, but also that's working for governments about government related work. We think actually working for private sector about um, regulation and government uh, productive work, uh, produced work is 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 a rich scene. And, and I think actually for our students tuning in, that certainly this is something I've heard before, that that kind of work can be very enriching as a lawyer because it's it's going beyond simply you know servicing a, a corporate uh, vehicle or or, or or that sort of thing it's actually getting involved in in the state and what's going on and i think given law. where we are now um you know people want to help effect change in a positive way uh, yeah. throughout the world i agree um, it's right down the pointed end that's that's probably a good point to, to begin to conclude i'm hoping that moray can uh, tune in for the last dying couple of moments but um in the meantime i'll start uh, the thank yous so thank you so much richard um uh, it's been an absolutely fascinating uh, hour session i wish we had more time but um hopefully you'll you'll come back and talk to us again uh, sometime soon um thank you again to all of the participants uh, for joining in today and for the questions that have come in and for the comments as well it's been very much uh, invigorating i think as we've just said it's given i i, I hope uh, a positive statement, a positive boost to uh, the students who are tuning in particularly, that although we are going through this great crisis, uh, there is going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, albeit it might be a, a twin hump tunnel or whatever the term, uh, a double dip tunnel uh, at the end of it. Uh, Mara, you're back with us. I'm afraid we're going to have to conclude there, but I'm so glad you could make it just for one more minute to, for me to thank you for taking the time for today and for your contributions today. And I think your, your mic is currently off, Mario. Do you want to just switch it on for your last comments? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the patience with the technology. Um, yeah, just say Richard and I are both on LinkedIn. Do find us and do do link in with us and do feel free to. Uh, again, to, to, to link in. Uh, to link in. I think we got we got that point through at the end. I, I, I'm going to quit while we're ahead and uh, draw us yeah. to a close. Again, Plus thank four, you. Thank four, you so seven, much. Four seven nine nine zero um, eight six 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 eight. eight. Is going now. Um, is thank now you so exiting. much. Uh, please do know, uh, do come to our next talk on the 24th of June. And uh, as, as has been said, do pass on your thanks and, and get in contact with Richard uh, and Moray as appropriate. But uh, thank you again, and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next of these events. Thanks for having us. Bye, thank guys. you, Barry. Thank you, Richard. And thanks to all of the team for helping us set this up to Madeline and our other uh, producers and to George and to Christine. Thank you.